We are, we are in Philippians chapter 2, of course, and uh, this should be uh, our final lesson of what is probably the best known section of Philippians, which is uh, verses 5 through 11, Philippians 2, 5 through 11, which is, a, uh, is one way of summing up the, the gospel or the scheme of redemption. It's also... Uh, a snapshot of the relationship between the the father and the son in the sense that it gives us it gives us some reference points as to uh, as to their relationship as to their identity and and so what we see within this is uh, is something that if you were to if you were to tell someone what the gospel is you're generally going to say something like what this is saying, but we've gone to a little bit of depth, and we've made it through verse 8, and so we're going to look at verses 9, uh, 9, 10, and 11, but first let's do just a quick recap, just so we have the whole paragraph here in context, and uh, we'll just go back to, back to verse 1, and let's just, let's go through this really quickly. Philippians 2, starting verse 1, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation of the Spirit, any affliction and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. And so we have those first four verses. Actually, they frame for us what is... What, what is maybe not obvious when you look at the rest of the letter, except for as you, uh, as you continue, you might see a little bit. Um, when you get to ver- uh, chapter 4, um, verse, verse 2, where you have the dispute between two ladies. Uh, but the, the way that the whole letter comes across gives us the idea that things are going really well at this congregation and we've looked at the history of it. We know the relationship that, that they have with Paul, that they've been uh, very uh, significant in the sense that they have they stand apart as a, uh, as a group of Christians that have helped Paul in a way that other, other congregations didn't. And so their faithfulness, their continued support of him is one of the things that makes him joyful brings him joy while he's there and so he wants them to continue to be strong uh you know i recently did kind of you know, some might call it a hard hitting lesson about how we just we just need to show up we just need to attend we need to fellowship with one another we need to be we need to be um uh, persistent and desire study uh learning um growing with one another encouraging one another just by being present in fellowship I was talking with someone after it, and, and I told him, I said, you know, if we're going to have new Christians come in here, if we're going to be evangelizing, really, the expectation is, is that we want them to come to a place that is as strong as we can be. And the only way we can do that is by actually being together as, as much as possible. And so what we find here is some division, perhaps, and Paul his desire for them is just to be as strong as they can be. And so he's going to encourage them in whatever way they can. Now, what you have is, remember, he's going to talk about Jesus and then about Epaphroditus as examples of the mind that you should have of selflessness. Then in chapter 4, that's when he's going to address the dispute or the division between the two ladies. And so you kind of have an argument building here that is a thread throughout, uh, but, but it doesn't... Um, how can I say it? It uh, it, it doesn't um, color the the whole of the letter. You don't read through the whole letter and think, well, this place got have, has lots of problems. And that's one thing we need to be clear about when it comes to our understanding of any particular congregation. As a congregation grows, in the same way that any individual grows, we're all going to have our own particular growing pains. We're going to have our particular weaknesses and things that we struggle with, and it's kind of going to be a roller coaster as we grow and as we struggle and as we need help on an individual basis and as a congregation going through different difficulties. 
Uh, and, and so just the fact that they're having this sort of a problem doesn't mean that they're still not bringing joy to the heart of Paul. It doesn't mean that they're, they're you know, no longer uh, characterized as, a, as a, the body of Christ or as a faithful church. Uh, because faithfulness is a, is a pursuit and a direction of submission to God and uh, a willingness to recognize your, your failings or your weaknesses or the things that you need to address. And so that's one of the, the great things about Paul's letters is it kind of gives us an idea of struggles that congregations would go through that help us see that it's inevitable that we're going to have difficulties and that we just need to be honest enough to just look at ourselves and say, okay, what is it that we need to, to do? How, how can we be more faithful? What needs to be addressed? And, uh, and that process of self-examination, of calling out things that, things that are weaknesses or things that we need to do better at, that that's part of faithfulness. That's, that's part of a willingness to, to be strong, to be our best. Uh, and so that's his plea in the first four verses. And then verse 5 he says, Philippians 2, 5, let each of you, excuse me, verse 5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Or the way that I've always memorized it, uh, the New King James, um, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And uh, it's the, the eternal mind of Christ that was on display when he entered into time. So, the, so that's, that's a couple of keys here to understanding as we continue through the paragraph all the way down to verse 11 is this understanding that Jesus has an eternal identity and an eternal mindset but that there are certain things that happens to him or that he does and that the Father does with respect to Jesus' entrance into time. And, and that's important because that differentiation is important in order to, to properly interpret the nature of Jesus. What, actually, what does it mean that, that the Father exalted him? What does it mean that he emptied himself? Well, we went through, we've gone through a lot of that. But, but in order to properly interpret this, we have to establish that Jesus is an eternal being, deity, equal with the Father and the Spirit, but different in person. And, and so there, there, there's a transition of a lowering and then an exalting that are independent from his eternal identity. And that's, that's vital because if you don't have that nailed down to begin with, then you run into some really weird interpretations of this. You come up with some really strange doctrines that you've probably heard of before, you know, like Jesus being created or Jesus being a lesser being than the Father, that kind of, that kind of thing. Um, so, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, the unchanging, that's the unchanging part, the form, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He already had equality with God. He did not need to, to take it, as some translations say, robbery. Uh, he did, he, it was not something that he needed to snatch, is another translation of that word. But he emptied himself. He did the opposite. He let go of it. He already had it. He was, he was willing to let go of his grasp upon it. Uh, so it, it says, um, not, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, verse 7, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. We talk about the idea of emptying himself being this, this uh, throwing off of his glory. And I made some arguments that if you, if you weren't here, you're interested in looking at the notes of that. I can talk to you later. The idea that the way that Jesus describes the things that he knows and the things that he can do, it seems as if he emptied himself even of his omnipotence and his omniscience while still retaining his identity. And that the things that he knew and the things that he did were, a, were directly from the Father. Anything he did, he was not able to do apart from the Father. And that uh, anything he said, he didn't say anything that was not of, that was of his own. He only said what the Father told him to say. Now, it's okay if you come to a different conclusion about that, but that also gives us a bit of an insight into his dependence on the Father, and uh, and of his 
okay, look. When we think of Jesus being perfect, a lot of times we, we like to think, well, he was perfect because he's, he's God. He's different than me. He's, you know, he, of course he could be perfect, right? Um, but, but we can't cheapen it. We can't cheapen it by thinking he, just because he had powers, insight, things like that, and it, it might be insight, you might say, but that he had things that we that we don't have and therefore he was able to do what we can't do we cannot take away his full humanity from himself Uh, it was pure determination pure laser focus of his purpose and reliance on the father that empowered him to be sinless it, it, there wasn't, it wasn't magical. It wasn't like he was impervious to it. If that's the case, then the, the sacrifice doesn't mean anything. His perfection doesn't mean anything. He kept, became like us. So he emptied himself uh, and made himself like us so he could experience all the temptations, but then, but then not give in to any of them. Now, that's a vital understanding. And any other interpretation of that it becomes problematic because it cheapens his example. It cheapens his sacrifice. It, uh, it removes from us a hope of uh, sanctification. It, and we'll, what I mean by that is it removes from us the idea that we can truly partake of the divine nature, that we can truly live transformed lives and be growing into the type of person in, that Jesus was. And, and I'm, you think about it in this sense, that, that the more that someone perseveres, in their faithfulness and to being transformed into the, the mind of Christ, as what is his plea here in verse 5, the more that a person does that, as they get older, yes, temptations are going to happen, Satan's still going to come after them, yes, but the older they get, the more that they are refined, the more that they are purified, the more that they become holy, which is the same as being sanctified, the less they are going to struggle with sin in the sense that they will have mastered self in the same way that Jesus was a master of self. And so, and so our, our goal as individuals is to, is to become masters of self along the lines of Jesus so that we are not continuously in the same struggle of temptation and sin for decades on end, but that we can break free from those things because Jesus' perfection was not because he was different than us. Jesus' perfection was in spite of being the same as us. And that's, uh, I believe that's a more, more accurate take, and it's empowering. It gives us hope that we can really grow and we can be something beyond uh, who we are. We're talking a total transformation, that really growing into the image of Christ. Okay, as we continue here, um, he emptied himself, verse 7, taking the form of a servant, being born in likeness of men, being born, found in human form. He humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on a, cr- on a cross. Okay, so a couple things. Uh, of course, he humbled himself uh, to the, the form of, of a servant and in the likeness of men, but not just the likeness, he actually became... He became a man, and Jesus refers to him, present tense, as the man Jesus. And uh, that, that his, it's hard to say it exactly, uh, that his, his personhood as a choice, uh, before he came as a human being, he was not a human being. But he chose to become a human being for the express purpose of being able to be a high priest between us and God. He had to be both God and man. Which means he took on to himself something that he didn't have to as far as what his identity is. In eternity, we will still be human because we're not, we're not deity. But he lowered himself and partook in humanity and continues to partake in humanity 
that's why he is the bridge between us and God. Okay, um, I don't want to rehash everything that I looked at before. If you want more in-depth, the, the lesson's online from last week. <clears throat> okay, the end of, verse, end of verse 8. Obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Jesus' submission to the Father and emptying of himself that brought him to the cross, which was torture, shame, that from where he started to the cross, the cross was as far away from where he came as was possible. That's really the takeaway from, from this, is the, is the distance between the two as far as what he could encounter and suffer coming here. There isn't any, there isn't any place farther away from where he was in the glory of heaven than the cross. He, he went, he went not, not only as far as he had to go, he went as far as was possible to go. That is, that is the takeaway from this. He went as far as was possible to go. So, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Being in the form of God, do not consider that something you need to hold him to. He'd empty himself and would go the opposite direction of it. That's the mind that he's saying that they need to have, that we need to have. That's the example of Christ, the total emptying of self, and so that you go farther away from the prestige or the glory of self as is possible, so that you can fulfill what is in the first four verses, which is to look out for others' interests more than yourself, to be humi- have humility and, uh, and unity. Therefore, verse 9, <clears throat> Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And so, obviously, you know, Jesus said, if you, if you want to come after me, you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Okay. Well, exaltation is always preceded by a humility, a total humbling of self. And what Paul is speaking about here in this idea of highly exalting him is it's not that Jesus is now becoming or being raised to something that he wasn't before, that he's changing in some way. What it is is that, is that he is returning to his former glory, and that's exactly what uh, Jesus prayed about in John 17, starting in verse 4. John 17, verse 4, Jesus prayed this, right, this is right before he's arrested. He says, I, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. That's, and that's fairly explicit there, this idea of, of let me return back to what I, what, what I had before. Now, if you, take, if you take this passage and you hold it up next to what Paul writes here, um, what you have is Jesus describing, Jesus describing what would happen right before his, his death. But it's the same thing that Jesus is describing in the sense that in one verse Jesus describes that he, he lowered himself from that glory. He's praying that God would elevate him back to that glory. And that's, a, that's a, like a parallel mirror type of a verse to Philippians 2, 5 through 11. This idea, and I'll read it again. He says, I glorify you on earth having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So, that's important. He's not being changed in his identity. He's not, he's not uh, anything uh, new as far as his, his intrinsic person. Uh, he, it is a return to where he came. And that's his, that's his prayer, and that's his ex- expectation. Now, this is, this is where we have, I want to say we have hope, but we, this is where we have some, some clarity as to both 
the power and the significance of what it means that Jesus actually was a human being. Uh, BC, I think, went, went to this passage uh, Wednesday, Hebrews chapter 2. If you want to turn there with me, I encourage you to. In Hebrews chapter 2, we have this description. And I've looked at this several years ago as we went through Hebrews. But let's revisit it because this helps us to see what, what happened. What, when Jesus enters into humanity, what does that mean for humanity? What does that mean for us? Um, what does it mean about humanity that he needed to enter into humanity? Hebrews 2, starting in verse 5. <coughs> Hebrews 2, verse 5. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, quote, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower for you made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, there's some confusion here as to who the, what's the, what's the antecedent to the pronoun, right? Who's the he? Who's the his, right? Um, and there's some debate about this. But when you think about this idea of what is man, you're mindful of him, the son of man, someone, people, some people take that phrase, well, referring to the son of man, that's what Jesus referred to himself more than any other title, and so this is talking about Jesus. But, but actually, if we, if we continue through it, he's just talking about humanity in general. What's, what's, what's us? That He made us a little lower than the angels. Uh, and you crown us with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. And that's what he did with Adam and Eve. He, he said, subdue the whole world. Everything's in subjection to you. But then he says, uh, verse 8, putting everything in subjection under his feet, now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. We are the pinnacle of creation. We are the dominant. Uh, uh, we're the, we are the dominant living thing on earth, right? At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Now, what does that mean? Is everything in subjection to Jesus when he's writing this? Yes, yes. But what about us? You, you might say, well, we have zoos and we've tamed animals and stuff like that. But there are things within the physical world that we have not conquered on our own. In particular, sin. And so we, because of our power, because of our intel intellect, how we've been created, we are able to dominate. And we do. But not everything. Verse 9, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus. So there's a transition, but we see him. Okay, now we're looking at humanity as a whole, but now there's another. There's another person, another person who exists outside of humanity, who for a little while was made low. And that doesn't mean that he was created. It just means that when he emptied himself, he lowered himself in submission to the Father. He came as a human being. And so we have this parallel here with Philippians 2. But we see him, verse 9, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. So he enters into humanity to do something for all of humanity. So we cannot keep sin uh, in subjection. Uh, we, are not, we are subject to it. We are slaves of sin. Uh, and, and one way that I think about it that makes it kind of clear to me is, is, that, is that humanity has gone off the rails of the ideal of God, of godliness, of his purpose, of his plan for us that started in Genesis 3-6. We go, go off the rails. So Jesus enters in, he enters into humanity, and he essentially takes humanity and he puts it back on the rails by tasting death for everyone by being perfect tasting death for everyone and in that way enabling those who had been the slave of sin to no longer be the slave of sin but to be able to follow Christ who dominated sin 
he did not sin in any way, and then conquered death. So he's not the slave of sin, he's not the slave of death. He died and then conquered death. Um, So let's continue here. Verse 10. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, it was fitting for the Creator, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children of God, I and the children God has given me. Verse 14. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. That through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. That's all they had the expectation of until Jesus came. The expectation of of, uh, lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. And a clearer understanding of who that is, of course, uh, a little snapshot is Galatians chapter 3. That the descendants of Abraham, I believe it's uh, verse... uh, 27, 28, 29, 30, does that have 30 verses, that the, the children of Abraham are those who are in Christ. So he says, for surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. In other words, those who come to God in faith. Verse 17, therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. So he is the sacrifice that takes the penalty for us. That's what propitiation means. Verse 18, for because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. And so, because Jesus humbled himself, being obedient even to the form of death, death to the form of death of the cross, Therefore, God has highly exalted him. Jesus then highly exalts all of humanity that are in him. And so we find within Philippians 2 our identity. We find our our status, our position, our our location. Uh, we, We find that the the fight against temptation and perfection leading to a full emptying of self and humiliating torturous death leads to exaltation and paul says have this mind in you because when you have that mind when you adopt his mind and you follow in his steps then exaltation is the only outcome of that because jesus was exalted all are exalted in him, that are in him. It doesn't mean everyone is saved. It means that everyone is in him is exalted. And um, you have oh, it slips my mind, but that's okay. Um, you have this understanding that that while Jesus died for everyone, okay, that's what I was thinking of. In Second uh, Peter 3, 9, you have Peter saying that, that God's desire is not for anyone to be lost, but that for all to come to repentance. And so you, you have available for everyone the avenue by which they can enter into exaltation in Christ and freedom from the slavery of sin if they will die to themselves in repentance, taking on the mind of Christ. And so this is parallel to what Jesus talked about in Matthew 16, when he says, if you want to come after me, you need to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. There's, there's only one solution to exaltation, and it's being united with the humiliation of Jesus. That's one of the, pro- the profound and really simplistic things about about the moment of conversion and baptism is the idea that I am... I am actively partaking. I'm, 
I am joining together. I'm, I'm doing this thing that, that is a uniting with his humiliating death and his exaltation. That's why it's so, it's so simple, yet yeah, it's so profound. That, that, that was, that's the solution. Uh, baptism may seem kind of strange, but it, it's actually brilliant. It's, it's of divine origin. And it has such a rich meaning to it because our moment of conversion is a, is a reenactment, is a joining in with the things that are described of Jesus in Philippians 2, of his total emptying of self and exaltation once he's, once he's been put to death. And so we are, we are put to death with him. And so, therefore, God has highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name that is above every name. And this is kind of strange. Uh, do you know that, that people kind of dispute, well, what name is that? Now, whenever I read this, I think he answers the question when he says, so that the name of Jesus, and it, 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 so, okay, follow me here. Some people think, well, does this mean he's given the name of, and this is kind of strange. I don't know why they think this. I guess they're smarter than me. Um, they think that he's given the, the proper name of Jehovah. There's some weird ideas about this. And I'm not talking about, um, you know, theologians that are really out there. They kind of struggle with, well, what's the name, right? What's the, is it a title? Is it a particular, you know, uh, because, you know, Jehovah's the, the, or Yahweh is a special name for God in the Old Testament, right? Uh, except that he, he just says that at the name of Jesus, at, which means that it, it isn't that he's, that he is given a new name. It's that his name means something different. Now that he enters, has entered into time, and there are some that argue that, of course, that in eternity past, he was not Jesus. That when he entered into humanity, he was Jesus. In eternity past, in the beginning, he was the, he was the Logos, or he was the essence, but that he did not he did not get the name until he came into humanity. He was the son of God. In fact, there are some who say that he was not even the son of God until he was begotten into humanity, and I don't go that far, and I still need to study that some more. But, but it doesn't mean that he's changed an identity. It means that he enters into time. And in entering into time, he has secured certain things. He has become, he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, but he becomes the sacrifice. That he wasn't before in, in the sense that he has realized it now. And having humbled himself and being exalted back to glory, he is, a, he is now uh, realized in the sense that he has, he has lived it out in, in time participating in humanity, the death, and then the exaltation. His identity stays the same. But in order for us to partake in the divine nature and for him to actually be the lamb that's slain, he has to actually enter into time and die. And so from one, from one perspective, there are certain things that Jesus in eternity past was not until he actually entered into time and did those things. And I don't want to get too deep into this or say that his identity is any different, anything like that. Uh, what I'm saying is, is that the mind of Christ remains eternal from eternity past to eternity future. But that within time as a human being, it caused him to do certain things. And that if we're to have the mind of Christ, that in our lives, in humanity, we follow in his steps, we're going to do so. It's going to compel us to do certain things. It's going to compel us. I mean, you, you think of it like this, okay? Um, if I sacrifice for someone, may I give my life for them, or I just uh, empty myself of my own concerns and then for someone else, what are they going to call me? They're, after the, the, the likeness of Jesus, they're going to call me sacrificial or a servant. And, and I'm not that until I do those things, until, until that mindset controls me within my life. And so when Jesus enters into humanity, that mindset ends in him doing one thing, and that is being uh, 
being willing to totally empty himself so that he can be the sacrifice. Okay, but this idea of the name that's above every name, I'll just read you what I have here because sometimes it's important to stay with how I word things. While the identity of Jesus has always been the sacrificial lamb from eternity past, uh, which you have in Philippians 1, 17 through 21, Re- Revelation 13, 8, he entered time to fulfill his identity. While eternal in being, his identity can, could only be realized in time, and so when he's exalted and given the name that's above every name, it, it's an echo of Matthew 28, 18, when Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And so he is king of kings and lord of lords, and he, by entering into humanity and totally emptying himself, he literally, um, I would say, earns, the, earns that title for humanity. Uh, as as the, the, only, the only human being who has ever not needed a sacrifice for himself. Uh, therefore, he is, he is worthy to be worshipped because he is perfect. Um, and so, which leads us into verses 10 and 11, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And that just means all sentient beings and and even you know uh is it jesus who says you know if if they don't worship me then the the rocks and the trees will cry out and worship me and in a sense the creative world even inanimate objects they glorify god and they worship god in a sense not as sentient beings you might say but as uh but as illuminating the glory of god and 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 him as the creator that uh, romans romans 120 that since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal divinity and Godhead. So they're without excuse. So the natural creative world shouts out to the sovereignty of God, right? But this is saying that every, every created being, you might say every eternal, every eternal created being, uh, either should or will and that's what's interesting about this it doesn't say that they will uh let's see so that the name of jesus every knee should bow so this is not about foretelling what the future is going to hold we, we often say well every knee is going to bow one day and i believe that is true but what this passage is saying is is there is making he's making a different point what he's saying is is that the identity of jesus means that that his worthiness his elevation to the right hand of the throne of God, his sovereignty, is such that every tongue should confess and every knee should bow. It's a, it's a characterization of his worthiness. And every day, one, and, excuse me, and one day every, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, in the sense that no one can escape in eternity the sovereignty of Christ and his lordship. No one will be able to escape that. But here, today, now, because of what he has done, everyone should do it. And so, uh, I, I think back to the word worship, which is a derivative of, of uh, a couple of words, worth-ship. It's, the, it's the, the nature of someone being worthy. Jesus has done what uh, makes him worthy of worshiping of bowing down to of confessing as lord and he is the only one worthy of of actually being a disciple of he's the only one that's worth following and then of course to the glory of god the father ultimate exaltation and blessing from god only comes through glorifying him the end goal of god for humanity is that Humanity would glorify God through Christ because that is the only way that God can bless anybody is for them to glorify him. And so the only way that Jesus was was, uh, blessed was that he glorified and submitted to the Father. You can go all through his ministry and that's the way he speaks about it. And I could go on and on about glorifying the Father and that being the only avenue for 
um, entering into his blessings um, and how that's, that's central to creation. We were created to glorify God. And, and so the more we empty ourselves and glorify him, the more he is able to access and bless our lives. And Jesus, Jesus writes the book on that. He sets the example of that totally. That brings us to the end of verse 11. Does anybody have any comments or questions? I know I was kind of going fast. This is a class, uh, but I kind of want to get through this material. Anybody have any insights about any of this or even disagreements? Different takes on, on something? Anything that resonated with you? I'm encouraged by you all being here this morning. And uh, let's have a quick prayer. We'll be dismissed. Father in heaven, we are humble before you. Just so thankful of how good you are to us. We don't deserve it. Uh, you are full of grace, full of truth, uh, full of mercy. Uh, and we thank you for loving us the way that you do. Uh, Lord, help us to reciprocate that. Help us to, to love you, to submit to you, to think of you uh, and your glory and glorifying you in everything that we can possibly do. And we ask all this to your glory and, and in your son's name. Amen.